Good morning, participants of the Latin America and Caribbean Summer School. Um, it is Friday, 10th of July, and we are pleased to welcome you back. Um, and after the first week of a so far very successful summer school, and I'd like to welcome our, our three panelists for today, and I'll briefly introduce them shortly. Uh, let me just do a quick recap of where we are. Uh, we started this week um, with a high level group of speakers, including the Director General of the IAEA and the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, uh, Mr. Dakumichu. Um, we had uh, very interesting discussions about the nature of nuclear weapons, uh, the, the nuclear fuel cycle, um, and rather scientific presentations on, on um, spreading the atom and nuclear energy. Uh, we had in-depth discussions about um, fissile materials and control of those materials, and then a very interesting discussion on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, one of the youngest Hibakusha, uh, Ms. Masaku Wada, who gave a testimony and it was, it was truly moving. Uh, she was a survivor of the Nagasaki bomb, uh, was a small baby at, at the time. But it, it served to frame the course very nicely. Um, yesterday, we had a truly amazing discussion on um, international law and the linkage with non-proliferation and, and disarmament, um, led by two prominent international lawyers, one from Mexico and one from the ICRC. And it was preceded by uh, a lecture by um, my colleague and colleague of Dr. Moore, uh, Dr. Philip Blake, on the motivations for nuclear weapon acquisition, which was also very, very interesting. So today we are focusing on more the, the active part of nonproliferation. And we're gonna be uh, hearing from three experts in the field of nuclear nonproliferation, um, dealing with the International Atomic Energy Agency, looking at international safeguards, and then also looking at the regional controls, uh, particular um, as this is implemented by, by ABAC. And I will not gonna uh, give more away. I think we have our speakers ready to, uh, to present. Um, so I just wanna remind participants that if you wish to ask questions, uh, use the Q&A box. And if you wish to ask the question in person, I'll be happy to give you uh, the microphone, but you must make sure that your microphone works. So let me introduce very briefly our speakers. Um, Ms. Uh, Irma Agriello uh, is the founder and chair of the NPS Global Foundation and head of the Secretariat of the Latin American Caribbean Leadership uh, Network. Um, she is, uh, holds a degree in physics uh, and an MBA and has completed uh, graduate study, studies in defense and security. Um, a true expert from the region and very well known, uh, has it written extensively. So Irma, thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, then I would like to also introduce um, another good friend and longtime colleague, Mr. Tariq Rauf. Uh, Tariq um, is a the former um, head of, of um, the IEA's um, basically external relations uh, division and um, served in the IEA for, for many years. Uh, he's also a former uh, senior officer at the at CIPRI's Disarmament and Arms Control Program, um, but for a long time was an advisor to the Canadian delegation, including at uh, the 95 NPT Review Conference uh, and, and 2000. So Tariq is not only an expert in NPT matters, but also an expert in all things IEA and and safeguards. And then um, last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. George Moore, uh, who's a scientist in resident uh, and adjunct professor here at CNS and at the Millbury Institute. Uh, also a very interesting background. Um, Dr. Moore was a senior analyst 
in the Office of Nuclear Security at the IEA um, and has worked uh, especially also on issues regarding illicit trafficking. Um, but he is um, a, both a legal expert um, as well as uh, uh, expert in um, nuclear physics. Um, maybe I'll, I'll allow George at the time to express, but uh, he, to give you an indication, he's a retired captain, a naval captain, um, and uh, has a lot of experience in nuclear testing as well as uh, nuclear weapons. So with that, I'm going to um, ask our speakers to, to start their presentations. And I ask that you do so one after the other. We're not going to have a break in between. And then uh, we will have time for question and answers um, after that. Okay, so Tariq, would you go ahead? Okay. I was just waiting for you to say that. Oh, no. Um, so is my presentation up? Not yet. Not yet. There you go. Got it? So Joy, is it up? No, it's there you go. It takes a little time. Uh -huh. you, so let me know when you, when you can see it. it. We can see it. You can you can click the um, slide, or you're gonna you're gonna just use it this way. Um, one second. Hmm. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to join this uh, online course for Latin American Caribbean uh, diplomats. Um, I will introduce the IAEA. This is a very big topic, but I will do a very selective uh, presentation. I have more slides than I have time for, but I will be sending them to Jean, and he will be circulating the PDF so you can study those slides on which I will not dwell upon in this uh, presentation. So the agency was established in 1957 after a famous speech by U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower on the 8th of December 1953 at the General Assembly of the United Nations, where he called for the establishment of an international atomic energy agency that would have a dual objective. The one would be to promote the peaceful uses of atomic energy and at the same time to guard against its uh, misuse, so to speak, for nuclear weapons purposes. So the IAEA came about in 1957. Over the years, it has established itself as the world's foremost intergovernmental forum for scientific and technical cooperation and the peaceful uses of nuclear technology, verification of nuclear non-proliferation obligations, as well as establishing the standards for nuclear safety and for nuclear security. The IAEA is limited to operations on the peaceful side of the nuclear field, uh, it doesn't have a role or it hasn't yet been given a role in the verification of nuclear disarmament as we understand it in terms of the five nuclear weapon states. Currently, the IAEA has 171 member states, which also includes non-NPT states like India, Pakistan, Israel, uh, North Korea is the only country that formally left the membership of the IAEA this is a few years before it left the membership of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty in uh, 2003. So the IAEA is governed by its statute. I already explained to you very briefly the two objectives which you see on, this, on the screen. The IAEA also has been given functions, which, is to, or which are to establish and administer safeguards or verification to ensure that special fissionable material or other materials are not used in a way as to further any military purpose. Military purpose is not specifically defined in the statute, but it is taken to mean, of course, military use for nuclear explosive purposes. Uh, IAEA member states are allowed to engage in non-explosive military nuclear activities, 
uh, such as uh, nuclear propulsion and to exclude nuclear material from inspections uh, for that purpose. But that is another uh, subject uh, beyond our mandate here today. So the agency also has been given rights and responsibilities. And this was something very unique at that time in the late 50s, early 60s, where the agency and international organization was given the mandate and the right to examine design information on what was then sensitive nuclear technology, such as uranium enrichment, plutonium reprocessing, reactor operations, and so on. And the principal countries at that time that were advanced in nuclear energies like uh, Japan, Germany, Canada, and others were very um, keen on guarding or safeguarding their sort of secrets, so to speak. So many of the limitations in the safeguards agreement come from these countries, the advanced industrial states of the late 60s and early 70s who were involved in the formulation of the NPT safeguards agreement, and I will come to that uh, in a minute. So the agency inspectors also have been given the right to obtain and to examine records of nuclear operations carried out in states where nuclear operations have been subjected to IAEA verification. So the current director general is from your region, is Ambassador Rafael Mariano Grossi, who took office in December of last year. Uh, he was preceded by Director General Yukia Amano, who unfortunately passed away in July of 2019. Before that was uh, Director General Albarade. I was hired by Director General Albarade and then served for a few years also under Director General Amano. The predecessors were Directors General Hans Flix from Sweden, Sigvard Eklund also from Sweden, and the very first Director General Sterling Cole was from the United States. There is no formal limitation on the term of the Director General. So the IAEA is one of the very few international organizations where the term of the Director General is not limited to two terms. So the IAEA has more than 2,500 staff members. There are more than 250 safeguards inspectors who are qualified and designated as such. And then the IAEA member states have accepted the designations of these IAEA officials as safeguards inspectors, and they are then accorded the rights and privileges of inspectors when they are carrying out inspections in the countries where they are operating. So the IAEA has two policymaking organs. The General Conference is the highest authority. It meets once a year for four weeks in September. This year, for the first time, the General Conference will be a virtual conference because of COVID. The Board of Governors meets ordinarily four times a year, or five times, so to speak. It has 35 member states. Uh, the current uh, chair of the board is uh, Sweden. The two vice chairs are Azerbaijan and Egypt. And from your region, the members are Argentina, Ecuador, Panama, uh, Paraguay, also Brazil. I forgot to highlight Brazil there, so my apologies, and Uruguay. Argentina and Brazil serve continuously on the Board of Governors, but unlike the Security Council, the continually serving members do not have uh, a veto. The IAEA's current budget is about 383 million euros, of which safeguards is roughly 150 uh, million euros, or about 39% of the overall budget. So you've heard uh, earlier on, as Jean explained, a uh, presentation on uh, nuclear energy. Despite what you might have heard, Nuclear energy is here to stay for at least the remainder of this century. Nuclear energy will continue to play an important role in meeting the sustainable development goals and in contributing to restricting uh, carbon dioxide emissions to below 2%. And nuclear energy is still quite cost efficient uh, in many countries, despite uh, complaints to the contrary. So the largest uh, user of nuclear energy in terms of reactors is the US, but the largest reliant on nuclear energy in terms of percentage of electricity generated is France, which is roughly more than 70%. And then there are other countries. So there are 30 countries at the moment that have operating nuclear power reactors. So the IAEA has three types of safeguards agreements. So when the IAEA was first established, as I mentioned in 1957, it was given this authority to carry out safeguards. 
but the IAEA statute is not self-implementing. That means that the safeguards have to be implemented through the negotiation of a specific safeguards agreement. So until the NPT came about in 1968, countries that had, oper that had voluntarily placed nuclear materials and uh, facilities under safeguards, uh, the IAEA had a system called IMSRIC 66, and uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Moore will explain that in greater detail. Uh, but then the IAEA brought with it comprehensive safeguards agreements, as did the nuclear weapon-free zones. So all five existing nuclear weapon-free zones except IAEA and PT safeguards as fulfilling the requirements of safeguards under uh, nuclear weapon-free zones. So the NPT safeguards are comprehensive safeguards agreements where non-nuclear weapon states are obligated to declare the entirety of their nuclear activities and nuclear materials uh, for IAEA verification. The five nuclear weapon states have voluntarily accepted safeguards on some of their civilian activities and the IAEA carries out very limited safeguards implementation activities in uh, some of the five nuclear weapon states. So if we look at the legal authority for safeguards coming from the NPT, here is the article, NPT Article 3, which provides for the legal authority. So the NPT itself does not create the safeguards. They leave it up to the IAEA to define what is the IAEA safeguard system. And here you will note it says that safeguards are for the exclusive purpose of verification to prevent diversion of nuclear energy from peaceful to military purposes. And then if we look correspondingly to the safeguards authority from the safeguards agreement for non-nuclear weapon states, it basically says the same thing, exclusive purpose of verifying uh, that material is not diverted from civilian to military activities. So this comprehensive safeguards agreement already gives the agency all the legal authority that it needs. But following the revelation of Iraq's parallel clandestine nuclear weapon development program in 1991, the IAEA provided the IAEA's Board of Governors provided additional tools to the agency, such as environmental sampling, broader access, so that the IAEA could implement its legal authority more efficiently. Um, this is the extent of IAEA safeguards coverage in a country that, in a non-nuclear weapon state that has a comprehensive safeguards agreement and also an additional protocol in force. So as of uh, now, there we have 183 states, including countries that are non-NPT states and the weapon states where safeguards are implemented. So 164 are NPT states, 136 states have uh, additional protocols, including the five nuclear weapon states and, and India. So in your region there, as far as I determined, as can determine, there are three countries that operate nuclear power programs, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. So if we look at the agency safeguards effort for last year, so the figures for 2019 are in bold and the figures for 2018 are not in bold. So you would have heard about a significant quantity for nuclear material, which is a rough quantity, enough for one nuclear device, that is 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium and eight kilograms of plutonium. So the agency has more than 200,000 uh, significant quantities under safeguards. This doesn't mean that each of these uh, 216,000 SQs is enough for a nuclear weapon, but it's a sort of an accounting measure that I'm sure Dr. Moore will explain in greater detail. So we have uh, more than 1,300 facilities under IAEA safeguards, including 19 enrichment plants and 11 reprocessing plants for producing plutonium. So the agency carries out a lot of technical activities that will be explained to you later, but it just gives you the effort that is involved in international verification of non-proliferation under the NPT and under nuclear weapon-free zone agreements. Jean also asked me to very briefly touch upon Iran. So here is a full page advertisement in the New York Times from the late 60s when Iran was, and the Shah of Iran was in the good books of the US and Westinghouse wanted to sell it to nuclear power plants. And here was an ad that even though Iran is swimming on a lake of oil, it still needs power. And of course, Iran has opted for nuclear power. Iran has a full nuclear fuel cycle from uranium mining to enrichment to reactors, and it has been charged with also a clandestine program for working on nuclear weapons uh, development. Uh, 
Um, so fast forwarding on the 14th of uh, July, 2015, the three European states, France, UK, and Germany, uh, plus the European Union and Russia, China, and the United States agreed on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action under which Iran accepted uh, limitations on its uranium enrichment program and also uh, again um, agreed to not to carry out any activities uh, related to nuclear weapons. So the IAEA issued a report in December 2015 which said that until 2003 and perhaps until even 2007 Iran was carrying out some activities that could be cons uh, considered as a coordinated effort for the development of a nuclear explosive device. But that these activities did not advance beyond feasibility and scientific studies, and that the agency did not find any credible evidence of diversion of nuclear material from civilian to military purposes. So if we look at the agency's effort, uh, so this is now called monitoring and verification. <clears throat> Under the JCPOA since 2015, the IAEA has uh, ramped up its inspections in Iran, uh, including complementary accesses, which is another word for short notice, or the press calls it snap inspections. All of these are being jeopardized once the United States announced in 2018 that it was no longer going to uh, adhere to the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action. Um, so during uh, the Obama administration, the agency issued 17 reports on Iran. During the Trump administration, the agency has issued 20 reports. Since 2003, when the Iran issue came uh, onto the surface, 96 reports have been issued by the IAEA. Thus far, the IAEA has concluded in each of these reports that there is no indication of diversion of nuclear material from civil to military uh, uses. But this year, the new Director General has issued two reports that raised this matter of possible undeclared nuclear activities, and the IAEA has asked for access, which thus far Iran has not provided. So the, Iran has now exceeded the limitations on its enrichment stockpile. It was limited to 300 kilograms. It now has 1,571 kilograms. It is operating about 16 different types of centrifuges. There was this explosion at the Natan centrifuge assembly plant a couple of days ago. So we will see how that has affected its uh, development of new centrifuges. So once Iran, sorry, once the US left the JCPOA, Iran has taken six graduated steps to step out of the JCPOA, but each of those steps is reversible and thus far not really proliferation sensitive uh, if we can preserve it at, at this particular level. So to end, if we look at the broader picture, we still have about 2000 metric tons, so that's 2 million kilograms of nuclear materials outside any international monitoring and verification. The four nuclear security summits only covered 17% of the world's nuclear material in civilian uses. So this 2 million kilograms of uh, weapon usable material is an important issue that should be dealt with in either Geneva through a fissile material cutoff treaty that includes stocks or some other measures uh, by which we can have more transparency. And uh, I will conclude with that and I suggest three readings. One is by former US Defense Secretary on the perils of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. One is uh, by my former boss, Director General Albarade on the age of deception. And then the Blix report, Weapons of Terror. And so I recommend these three readings to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, great and good lecture. Thanks for keeping it. Uh, to the point, it was one, and I appreciate the uh, the readings. I mean, that's uh, I think uh, uh, participants have been asking for some suggested readings, and uh, I think these are excellent suggestions. George, George, just unmute. Yeah, I'm I'm All unmuted right. now. Thank you, uh, Tariq. Can you just uh, okay. here we go. You see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, as uh, Jean uh, mentioned, uh, well, I should start out. Buenos dias a todos, and uh, welcome to you all. It's difficult because I can't see everyone. Uh, and as Tariq mentioned, I have more slides probably than I'll have time to actually touch on. 
some of them briefly, you will have the presentation and hopefully you can go back and look at things that you might find interesting. I do want to start off here with, for some reason my system is not paging, paging down. Ah, here we go. Okay, um, I want to start off with a bit of history that predates uh, Eisenhower's Adams for Peace. I want to talk a little bit about the, the different safeguard regimes. I want to uh, talk about other aspects of the IAEA other than the safeguards operation itself, which deal with nuclear material and other radioactive material. So a bit of history. Uh, as you know, and this is mentioned in prior lectures, <clears throat> the war ends, uh, bombs have been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. U.S. is the only nuclear power. Uh, the United Nations gets formed, replaces the defunct League of Nations. They try and do things and set things up so that they won't fall into the same traps that the League of Nations uh, addressed. And one of the initial things that they were concerned about is how could this new atomic energy and nuclear weapons be controlled? And what they established was the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, most of you have never heard of that because it was disbanded in 1952. It was founded by the first resolution of the UN General Assembly in 1946. And it was specifically designed to deal with the problem raised by atomic energy, both reactors, uh, which were power reactors were well on the horizon, but nuclear weapons uh, were of great concern. <clears throat> and there's some lessons in this for today because the UNAEC never could do anything usefully because the US and in those days the Soviet Union <clears throat> excuse me, could not get along. And when the major powers don't get along, um, nothing gets done. So the UNAEC died, but safeguards those on. Let me just, um, I'm looking for, this is actually from that first resolution in 1946, and you'll see item D here for effective safeguards. Safeguards is an older concept that predates Eisenhower's Adams for Peace, it predates the IAEA itself. And you can make the argument, these are some of the things that the AEC, UNAEC tried to deal with. You've heard about the Baruch plan, the idea of maybe putting nuclear weapons under some sort of international control. Again, <clears throat> uh, this is historically interesting, but not terribly relevant for today. Um, when the IAEA <clears throat> was created in 1957, you can argue that it was a replacement for the defunct UNAEC. Uh, it reports the Security Council, uh, and, but it's an independent agency. Uh, this confuses a lot of people. A lot of people think that it's still uh, like the UNAEC, which was under the uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, it's not. It's an independent agency. The Director General uh, of the IAEA, in theory, has similar standing to the Director General of the UN. Uh, in reality, there's a recognition that uh, uh, the UN is a much bigger organization and overshadows everything. But <clears throat> Article 3 of the statute of the IAEA, and the statute is not very long, and I would, if you haven't read it, I would recommend you do. It authorized the establishment of safeguards and to apply them at the request of parties to an international instrument or to the request of a state. Um, Article 12 set up the safeguards program with a staff of inspectors. Now this, remember we're going back to the late 1950s, 1957, 1958 timeframe. The way the IAEA does business is through the issuance of information circulars, IMSERCs. Now, IMSERC 26 was in 1961 and applied to research, tests, and power reactors, which were less than 100 megawatts thermal. For reactors, we give two different kinds of rating depending on what, <clears throat> what we're looking at. Most power reactors, like for example, the, uh, uh, the ones in Mexico, those are about 600 to 700 megawatts electrically rated because they're power reactors. A rule of thumb is that if you multiply whatever their electrical rating is by about three, you get their thermal rating. So those 
let's say 700 megawatt electrical units are actually producing three times as much or about 2100 uh, megawatts of thermal energy. Other types of reactors, for example, submarine reactors are rated only on their thermal power output because they're not used to produce electricity. It was mentioned by Tariq that MSERC 66 in 1967 established pre-NPT safeguards. So it's important to understand that you have, you have countries in the world such as India, um, Israel, uh, that although they're not NPT signatories, therefore they're not under regular safeguards, they do have pre-NPT safeguards. Um, Pre-NPT safeguards rely on the states to declare facilities. Uh, that's similar to the way the first major safeguards, MSERC, MSERC 153, uh, came about and required states to declare their nuclear materials and their facilities. So NPT, which went into effect in 1970, requires non-nuclear weapon states to accept safeguards on all nuclear materials per Article 3. This means that each of these states has to execute a separate agreement with the IAEA to set up their safeguards programs. One thing until you get to the IAEA, which a lot of people don't realize, safeguards lives in its own security world. By that I mean information flows into safeguards, safeguards information is closely held within safeguards and is not distributed in inside the agency, outside of safeguards. I was there for five years in nuclear security. Uh, with very little exception, did I ever get any information out of safeguards. We worked on some projects together, but it was always information flowing into safeguards. So MSERC 153, which is not typically referred to as comprehensive safeguards, under things like the Nuclear Suppliers Group, uh, we have the U.S. Uh, 123 agreements, one of which is with Mexico, uh, which define things and they refer to MSERC 153. This is the basic safeguarding agreement. This is the one that came about as a result of the MPT, and it covers many things and is a little more broad than the common interpretation of its scope. Uh, it does provide for uh, inspections uh, of um, on-demand inspections. It is rarely if ever used or rarely if ever has been used. So under the statute, there's a definition under Article 20 of source and special fissionable material. These are unique terms to the IAEA and you really need to look at that and read exactly what's involved. MSERC 153 established a state's system of accounting and control. This is the bookkeeping aspect of safeguards. Uh, other elements of 153 cover information and access, how inspectors get there, uh, that sort of thing. States make an initial declaration of their nuclear material and facilities, and this is verified then by inspection. Tariq mentioned and other speakers have mentioned the term significant quantity. This is a term that causes a lot of confusion uh, both internationally and also uh, here at Monterey within our student body. Uh, significant quantities are defined in a number of different ways. They're defined for different materials, principally uranium-233, 235, and plutonium. They are basically an amount that will establish a weapons program. It is not the amount required for a nuclear weapon. And this is an important distinction. Uh, the numbers, for example, uh, 25 kilograms for U-235 in a separated mode, and eight kilograms for plutonium uh, separated. Um, these are not the amounts required for uh, a nuclear weapon. The Department of Energy, which is the organization in the United States, which makes nuclear weapons, designs them, builds them, uh, makes them, and then turns them over to the military, um, they have admitted that a nuclear weapon can be built with four kilograms of plutonium. Uh, that may not be built by, uh, may have to be an advanced state in order to do that. But the SQ is an important quantity because it ties into the inspection frequency for IAEA inspections. 
the goal of the inspection frequency is to detect the diversion of an SQ. So the cycles for an inspection for a different for a country are based on how long it would take them to produce an SQ and to divert it. So if you were to decrease the values of the SQ, then you would have to increase the inspection frequency. Uh, Tariq mentioned the uh, funding for the IAEA. Uh, the funding is not really all that generous in the grand scope of things. If you look at how much a modern uh, fighter jet or bomber costs, uh, what's spent on the IAEA, which has such an important international role, is not much more than one airplane per year. Um, it's just not all that uh, uh, well funded. So it's important to understand that detection and diversion is the goal of safeguards. It is not prevention of diversion. IAEA safeguards do not prevent diversion, although they may have a deterrent effect. In other words, the fact that a state knows that diversion can be detected may deter them from attempting to divert material. But the prevention of diversion is more an aspect of nuclear security. So other things that need to be mentioned, the small quantities protocol for countries that don't have uh, a large amount of, of um, uh, nuclear material holding. Uh, the current kind of gold standard is the model additional protocol. Uh, it expanded the IAEA's ability to do inspections within the state, provided for environmental sampling, very important, uh, allows for total inspection of the fuel cycle. And what you're seeing is, and this started back with uh, things that went on in Iraq, uh, a shift in safeguards from facility level inspections to looking at the state as a whole. This is called the state level inspection concept. Uh, this is the current concept. The IAEA, uh, to some extent, although it's really not an intelligence agency, it has some aspects of that. They use, for example, satellite photography. They use uh, uh, open search searching um, uh, to look at any indications that a state might be attempting to develop a nuclear weapons program. Sorry. Um, well, safeguards doesn't do it all. I mean, and this is one of the, I wanna spend pretty much the rest of my time on this. Uh, raises awareness. Typically people talk about the non-weapons military use as a loophole. For example, nuclear power submarines. I think that's a misnomer. This is not a loophole. It's not something that the, in negotiating the NPT was not taken into account. It was actually something that was very deliberate. Uh, you do have, and this is a separate aside, but something you may find interesting. You do have non-NPT states, India, for example, that has nuclear submarines, uh, started out by leasing uh, nuclear powered submarines from the Soviet Union, then leased one from the Russian Federation, now has built its own. Uh, Safeguard doesn't account for non-state actors. The NPT doesn't stop, account for non-state actors. And it doesn't cover all weapons materials. Uh, you, some of you may know that there are things other than plutonium and uraniums that uh, can be used to build nuclear weapons. Uh, these are fairly rare elements, and difficult to acquire for even a weapon state to acquire sufficient amounts of these materials. But they're not, typically safeguarded. Um, safeguards isn't safety and it isn't security, both of which are separate aspects of the, of the IAEA's program. Safeguards is mandatory. Security and safety are not. These are recommendations by the IAEA as to how to run a program. Uh, I mentioned earlier, safeguards has its own classification system and it keeps safeguards information within safeguards. Safeguards doesn't deal with other radioactive materials, such as those that might be used in a dispersal device or a simple explosion device. Uh, the agency does have a code of conduct for radioactive sources, but that code of conduct uh, doesn't deal with a lot of issues that are related to it. And it's limited to sealed sources, uh, categories one through three, 
I'll touch on those briefly, uh, but I'm beginning to run out of time here. So this is the way the IEA categorizes nuclear material, uh, plutonium, uranium-235, uranium-233, categories Roman 1, 2, 3, and then what you do with less than category 3. This actually comes from uh, a, uh, a non-binding publication. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And if you read footnote C, which you can't really read on the screen, but you'll have this when you have a copy of the presentation, you can look at it. The, non <clears throat> the other radioactive materials, other than nuclear materials, uh, are broken down into five categories by the IAEA. IAEA. And for example, the code of conduct only covers one through three. Um, a couple of things, and we'll touch on these quickly. Binding international agreements that relate. Uh, Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material in its 2005 amendment. This is what covers the security of the nuclear materials, physically protecting them. Uh, of course, we know about the NPT. Um, and there is an, another thing that's interesting, the Convention on Early Notification of a Nuclear Accident, which covers states' responsibilities to notify in the event that radioactive material from some accident or incident is going to cross their borders into another country. Non-binding, there's MSERC 225, rev current revision is 5. This is what was basically the basis for the CPPNM. It is still a guidance. Uh, it covers a little bit more than what's in the CPPNM. Code of Conduct, we've mentioned already. There's a whole series of nuclear security fundamentals documents, recommendations, and implementing guides, and there are safety standards. All of these documents are, with very few exceptions, available online from the IAEA in PDF form at no cost. Uh, code of Conduct, I've spent enough time on that, let's keep going. There's a concept at the IAEA called the three S's, security, safety, and safeguards. Uh, if you prioritize these, uh, it would be just by importance to the agency, it would probably be just the reverse, safeguards being first, safety being second, security, which is a new kid on the block, uh, being last in the order of priority. But if we look at these, safeguards deals with nonproliferation, security deals primarily with counterterrorism, in other words, protecting the radioactive material or nuclear material from uh, bad people, and safety deals with accident prevention. If you put these all together, the intersection here, if you draw a Venn diagram, is in nuclear materials. Uh, so a couple of things not to be overlooked, and I'm almost done here. Uh, importance of the technical cooperation aspect of the IAEA. Uh, remember in the NPT, you have kind of this exchange of information, people giving up pursuing nuclear weapons, states giving up pursuing nuclear weapons uh, in cooperation for receiving information uh, about how to implement and use peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Technical cooperation supports a lot of that. It's a big portion of the agency. Uh, Another thing that many of you may not have heard too much about, the International Emergency Center, the IEC, this is a 24 seven operation uh, by the IAEA. Each country has a representative um, uh, in the country. This is a, a place where you can go 24 seven, get assistance with any kind of accident. It was a major operation during Fukushima. Uh, it does not go around the country that requests information or requests assistance. What it does is acts as a buffer, and in many instances, in some of which occurred in Central and, and South America, uh, gets uh, assistance uh, to the country which is having the problem. Uh, some of these problems have been where people have gotten exposures and they needed to be medevac for treatment. Uh, summits, I don't want to spend any time on that. There were the nuclear security summits started under President Obama. There were four of them. The follow-on to those are ministers meetings at the IAEA. Um, I don't think, current, certainly not with this regime, but uh, certainly not with this administration in the US, uh, we'll see any more security summits. Uh, a final advertisement, uh, we do here at Monterey um, have a one week tuition free uh, safeguards course run in conjunction with Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, runs the first week in June. There's information here on where you can go to find out about that. Uh, we had this year a woman from Mexico 
Uh, we've in time, past times had some participation uh, from Latin and South America, but we certainly like to increase that. I think that's all I've got. I'm sorry, I uh, didn't have time to go over everything in detail. Thank you, George. I'm sure there will be questions uh, to you um, during the Q&A, so we can go in more detail then. Irma. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to share my views about the implementation of safeguards in Latin America and uh, the role of ABAC. As Argentina, uh, it, it's, a, it's a topic very close to my experience and to my interest from the very beginning, since I found MPS Global. And even um, emotionally, it was the first time I, I addressed to an international conference in Oslo uh, in 2008 uh, was just about this topic. So um, let's, uh, I put my presentation to, to share with you. Okay, well, I have a, a short agenda. Uh, I have more charts than uh, the, the time allocated for the presentation, but um, I wanted to, to leave you like, like a conceptual body of, uh, uh, of topics that could be functional to, to understand what uh, we want to, to talk about, uh, the, the common system of savers between Argentina and Brazil and the role of ABAC. So, uh, we have some information about, about safeguards in Latin America and the Caribbean. I, I will focus on the status of the region. Uh, most of the concepts have been addressed by my colleagues before, so uh, I, will be, uh, I will go very quick through, the, through them. Then the, the second point is under, how understanding Argentina and Brazil mutual nuclear verification system. Why is it unique? The path for nuclear rivalry to cooperation. Some uh, details about cooperation and practical details about uh, about today. Then, uh, I, uh, if the time uh, is uh, is enough, I, I will address key issues uh, like a back as a replacement of additional protocol. Can be back an inspiration for regions with conflicts involving nuclear dangers. It has been always said that uh, as a successful model could be applied in other regions. We we discussed some about that. So uh, a very brief point about the safeguard for the Brazilian nuclear power summary and the future. So um, we in this uh, the state commitments under MPT. Uh, requires a um, comprehensive cyber agreement. This comprehensive uh, uh, cyber agreement are uh, designed or in indicating Article 3. Uh, uh, and the, the, the most important thing is that they, they should cover all source and special fissionable material. On the other hand, commitments under the Tlatelolco Treaty all our countries, the 33 countries in the region are uh, state parties of the law treaty. Also, in Article 13, uh, requires a comprehensive safeguard agreement applicable to all nuclear activities. The, uh, the elements in the safeguard system of today could be then comprehensive safeguard agreement designed to verify the correctness and completeness of state declarations to ensure not diversion of the current nuclear material to nuclear weapons or other explosive devices. Then the additional protocol to CCA, CSAs designed to better verify the correctness and completeness and to detect and declare materials and activities. Then the many countries with the little or no nuclear activities and material uh, have uh, additional small quantity protocols to CSAs. And uh, finally, uh, a more recent development uh, by IAEA is the state level approach that is designed to prioritize relevant uh, conditions uh, refers to the states rather than solely taking into account quantity and type of declared nuclear materials and facilities. 
well, we, we have the information here, I, I, I won't address this, but uh, the purpose, uh, the most important thing that CSA is the Comprehensive Safer Agreements require the establishment of a state system of accounting and control. This is the most important thing. And uh, of course, this state system of accounting and control is replaced in the case of the bilateral relationship between Argentina and Brazil by a, a common system of accounting and control. Then uh, the additional protocol uh, ruled by INSERG uh, 540. Uh, the most important thing here is that uh, IAA emphasized that in a state without an additional protocol for the agency is unable, unable to provide credible assurance of the absence of undeclared nuclear material and activities. I am uh, highlighting these specific points because it has to do uh, with a very specific situation of the relation between Argentina and Brazil uh, and nuclear, in terms of nuclear safeguards. The purpose of additional protocol, we have information here uh, that could be useful for you. Then the small quantities protocol. Uh, the most important uh, is um, uh, to this, this chart, perhaps, that shows uh, the status of the safeguard implementations in the region. We have seven countries. Uh, all, uh, all countries in the regions are uh, state parts of uh, parties of MPT and Tlatelolco Treaty. And uh, in most of them, uh, all of them has a, a comprehensive safe and agreement. Seven of them uh, with relevant uh, nuclear materials and activities has an additional protocols in force. There are uh, two, three of them uh, relevant uh, with uh, no uh, additional protocol in force, in particular Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela. And then you have any, any other categories concerning those uh, states with um, uh, CSA, but uh, small quantity protocols uh, with or without additional protocol in force. Um, for uh, according dates, uh, information of uh, 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 SAVAR uh, implementation report of uh, 2018, uh, we have in the region 17 out of 33 states uh, uh, in which a state level approach has been applied so far. Not in Argentina, not in Brazil not in Colombia, not in Mexico. The, the, the asterisk uh, shows which countries uh, have been subject to state level approach. So, we go to, to the ABAT system the, uh, to understand a little bit more the Argentina-Brazil mutual verification. Brazil and Argentina uh, are, I could say, the most developed uh, the countries in nuclear terms. They are the most advanced in the region, uh, include uh, both of them as power reactors, research reactors, sensitive technologies, such enrichment, reprocessing in the past. Both countries are developers of nuclear technology, and Argentina in particular is an international supplier of research reactors. Uh, why uh, the system between Argentina and Brazil mutual verification system is unique? Because in, it's uh, a very original bottom-up idea. It uh, searched before countries assess the, the international uh, commitments under the MPT and the local treaty, and it. Uh, it appears because a common decision of a country to uh, switch from rivalry, from rivalry to uh, cooperation. Um, we can see in, in some timeline I have there uh, that uh, during the, the military government period in the 60s and 70s, there was some kind of uh, 
some kind of preeminence um, in terms of um, nuclear development uh, in the region. So, uh, in certain moment, when the democratic governments have access to the power in both countries, um, this this concept uh, was judged for for the governments as um, little practical. So they decide to to work together to to change this uh, mindset of the past. So. Uh, it's, uh, the, the system is unique because it has been an enable for both states to fully access to the Tlatelolco Treaty and the NPT, and uh, has been creative in the sense to design uh, an innovative system of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor control. Uh, uh, one inspector from one country uh, make inspections to the other countries' facilities. So uh, you, we, got, we have here some kind of timeline, uh, but uh, the most important thing through, through the time here is that in the 80s uh, begins this process to rapprochement uh, between both countries. In the past, uh, during the military governments, there was an international myth uh, concerning non-peaceful -peaceful development, specifically uh, the interest of countries to develop an atomic bomb. It hasn't been proved, uh, even though some uh, politicians in certain moments of this long history have uh, taken advantage of the situation and tried to disclose some information, but in, in reality, none of the two countries were, were even in military government close to the bomb. The, the important uh, thing, uh, if, if we see this timeline, is maybe the, the, a, a, a milestone in 1985 where President Sarney and Alfonsine uh, lay the foundations of the Mercosur, the common markets of the of Southern Cone, uh, and uh, they, they released a joint statement of nuclear policy and the creation of the Permanent Commission on Nuclear Policy with the, the object of, uh, objective of uh, discuss uh, the, the positions of both countries. Then another point of in confidence building was the visits, the, the cross visits uh, to sensitive uh, facilities, in particular an enrichment plan, plant. In 1987, uh, Brazilian delegation to Pilcanigeu, a gas diffusion enrichment plan in Argentina. And next year, Argentine, Argentine delegation visit, visiting uh, enrichment plant in Brazil. And uh, the, 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 another important milestone was the, the As Asuncion Treaty, the Tratado de Asuncion, that uh, uh, released uh, or, or, or start with the Mercosur. And finally, the same year, 1991, was a very active year for the, the, to the confident building of two countries. And uh, 19, in July of 1999, uh, was signed the bilateral nuclear agreement, uh, uh, known also as Guadalajara Agreement or SCCC Agreement, that is reflected in, in CIRC uh, 393. This, um, this agreement. Uh, it enters into force uh, in December, and at the same time that uh, we have the, in December of 1991 the signature of the quadripartite agreement that includes both actors, Argentina and Brazil, ABAC and IAEA, and is this reflect in, in CIRC 435. Then we have, uh, as a consequence of the confident building, in 1994, Argentina and Brazil fully implements the Tlatelolco Treaty. In uh, 1994, also quadripartite agreement enters into force. 
1995, Argentina joins the NPT. 1998, Argentina, uh, Brazil joins the NPT. And there, uh, in, uh, since that moment, there uh, has been several um, meetings and, and agreements, partial agreements uh, concerning nuclear issues. Um, and uh, all the systems uh, began to, to work in 1991. To the point that uh, the relevant point was when nuclear supplies group authorized uh, as a condition of supply for enrichment and reprocessing ex uh, uh, exports or, or supply, uh, that recipients has all uh, has a, a CSA and additional protocols in force, or pending this, is implementing appropriate safeguard agreements in cooperation with the IAEA including regional accounting and control arrangement for nuclear material as approved, approved by the IAEA Board of Governors, in clear reference to the Argentina and Brazil system. To go further uh, about the, the agreement, the agreement uh, uh, in 1991, bilateral agreement, uh, uh, there, uh, Argentina and Brazil undertook the use of all nuclear material and facilities under their jurisdiction or control exclusively for peaceful uses. Take into account here that none of both countries were obliged by any, neither uh, by uh, MPT nor by the Telolco Treaty at that time. Then prohibit and prevents in their territories and abstain from carrying out, promoting, and authorizing, direct and direct, any way of testing, manufacturing, so or related to uh, uh, any nuclear weapons or even deployment of other nuclear weapons in the in the territories of both countries. So is the uh, re, re, they, they reaffirm here the exclusively uh, peaceful uh, purposes. Then, uh, importantly, uh, creates the common system of accounting and control, uh, with, which is a full scope, full scope safer system applied to all nuclear activities covering all nuclear materials in both countries. It is a, a, a very strong mutual confidence measure that give the, the, the way to the creation of, uh, at the same time, the Brazilian and Argentine agency, agency of accounting and control of nuclear materials, ABAC. The, the purpose of ABAC is to implement and manage the SCCC. Well, the ABAC role there is uh, just, uh, ABAC is an independent binational agency, is uh, the role is verification on control of safeguards. Uh, of course, uh, ABAC uh, in practical terms, terms can appoint inspectors, perform inspections, and design the procedures to do that. Brazilian inspector verify Argentine facilities, uh, neighbor to neighbor control, and Argentine inspector verify Brazilian facilities. Then, uh, uh, the, another important milestone, uh, very relevant, is the quadripartite agreement enforced since March 1994. And uh, with the incorporation of IAEA and ABAC, uh, together with both countries, uh, the quadripartite agreement satisfies the obligation of states under Article 13 of the Telolco Treaty and Article 3 of the MPT and it has been com uh, completely and clearly stated. And it, uh, it also was inspiring the, in the decision of states to request the participation of the agency. Uh, to that time, there was uh, uh, still no obligation uh, through um, MPT or through the Telolco Treaty. And of course, we have firms the purpose of verifying that material is not diverted to nuclear weapons and other nuclear explosive devices. 
Uh, a concept uh, of the uh, quad tripartite agreement is that a BAC and a IAEA uh, should avoid unnecessary duplication uh, efforts of safeguard activities, but uh, very important, both agencies must keep independent conclusions. This seems uh, something very contradictory, but this uh, as the, the system works. Uh, because a bank must cooperate to ensure IAEA reaches its verification goals uh, during the joint uh, verification activities and even provide uh, technical capabilities and uh, technological commercial information, etc. So, the cooperation between a bank and IAEA uh, implies. Uh, share safeguard approach, etc. And even materials. You have here the structure of a BAC, the commission, the, the high, two high level government officials from each country, secretariat, the executive role, two secretaries, one from Argentina, one from Brazil. You have there uh, this, the current secretary, uh, the secretaries Elena Maceiras and Marco Marzo. Elena Maceiras from Argentina, Marco Marzo from Brazil. Then you have the structure, the, the, the is, uh, administrative and technical structure, uh, of, uh, and the HQ's uh, headquarters of uh, ABAC are in Rio de Janeiro with an office in Buenos Aires. You have here the ABAC today, the, the current safeguards, uh, um, the installations uh, uh, under safeguard, safeguard are 77. You have there the structure, include the two multipurpose uh, reactors uh, uh, in, in project, isotopic separation laboratories, enrichment plants, small power reactor uh, under construction, and the land prototype of naval reactor in Brazil. Uh, in, in 2019, uh, back, uh, uh, carried out um, 105 inspections, and you have here the, the breakdown of those inspections. There have been uh, many accomplishments of a back driver for growing bilateral cooperation, even in different uh, topics and different fields beyond the nuclear one. A successful example, uh, taken into account in other, in other parts of the world by the international community, uh, they, they paved the way for ratification of international instruments. And of course, uh, it has been due to the technical excellence in application of safeguards in both countries. And it is perceived as a model with potential application in other regions that this something to be discussed further. In terms of uh, replacement of ABAC, uh, of additional protocol, I, I will take the, the last. Uh, you, you know that uh, none of our countries signed the additional protocol, uh, and they are the only members of the nuclear supply groups in such situation. Uh, yeah, I mentioned before the waiver of 2011 of the NSG authorizing the, uh, or taking as the condition of supply, uh, valid condition of supply uh, that uh, the, the ABAC system uh, in the bilateral relations. But the interpretation of the NSG waiver has been slightly different in both countries in terms of that what the, does it mean pending this, if it's something permanent or, or transitory? Brazil has taken as more permanent than Argentina, so the, there are a, a different approach about this specific topic. But of, of course, uh, even the NSG has stated that while pursuing the same purpose, the, the protection mechanisms are not the same. Uh, but uh, at the same time, Brazilian national defense strategy clearly states is of uh, 2008 that Brazil would not endorse any further restrictions derived from NPT 
if nuclear weapon states do, do not show progress on their own disarmament. So the bottom line of this topic is that further debate is required on this issue. Is an AP affordable for Argentina and Brazil? Would their national technologies keep protected? There, is, there has been a, a, an issue of big concerns in both countries that have developed their own technologies. What would happen if one of the countries decide to sign the standalone? What happened with the system, the bilateral system, the, the common system? And would an AP erode the, the common system and about? They are all questions. This is an open issue. And as inspiration of other regions, uh, I have studied that. Uh, I, I leave you a reference to if you are interested on, on deep on, deep on this topic. But uh, uh, my conclusion is that it's not so easy because it depends on many dimensions. Uh, we, we need to take into account that uh, the relationship, the previous relationship, between Argentina and Brazil was not a com very conflictive, but just a rivalry, but not a, a very open conflict. So it was difficult to, to apply the efficiency of a back model to directly to, to different regions. And then uh, to finish, uh, concerning the, the, the Brazilian nuclear power summary, that is a long-standing uh, Brazilian uh, goal, national goal, since 1978-79. Uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a very it's an open situation, not because uh, it is for uh, pro nuclear propulsion uh, forbidden by the NPT, uh, but uh, it, Brazil would be the first non-nuclear weapon state to have a nuclear power summary. So it requires uh, to be creative and to, to further analyze how uh, safeguards uh, would be applied to the materials, to the fuel of the, the reactor of this nuclear power submarine. But it's important to, to point out that uh, the, the issue is indirectly cons considered in, in CIRC 153, but very directly consider address in the quadripartite agreement uh, in the article 3 uh, that uh, says if a state part intends to exercise its discretion to use nuclear material which is required to be safeguard under this agreement for nuclear propulsion or operation including submarine and prototypes the following procedures will should, shall apply so there are a lot of steps that must be taken before the material is withdrawn from Cyprus to, to be uh, in a submarine that uh, should be in a, in a situation of uh, not, uh, not be controlled during its uh, uh, navigation. So uh, the path of future uh, uh, potential uh, improvement are improvement of cooperation between ABAC and IEA through delegation, this could be a path, feasibility of a regional expansion, inclusion of roles concerning nuclear safety, security, or nuclear disarmament verification. All these topics here are on the table, they are all open, and there are uh, much work done by the, the experts about every one of these topics and uh, I, I will not go further on that. I, I leave uh, in, the uh, in the presentation, in the material, several of my work in, in different of this topic. Uh, and as final remark, as a, I, I would say that as, as a region with a strong vocation of peace, we have been Latin America and the Caribbean pioneer uh, as a uh, in the development of, of international instruments. Such relevant effort has been done without resigning, resigning states' legal and legitimate rights to the peaceful development of nuclear energy. 
And all this, that the law called bilateral agreements uh, that led to a back, and moreover, the, the successful are a vivid evidence that the region has a good led by example. However, however, and my last message, we should not rest on our achievements. On the contrary, on the contrary, we should go, should go on working to improve them and disseminate these good practices uh, yeah, all over the world. This is our real challenge of Latin Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Irma, uh, for a really interesting and comprehensive talk. Uh, you've touched upon a couple of interesting things there that I want to come back to. But uh, we have um, a number of uh, people to ask questions. Um, I'm going to start off uh, asking uh, Pablo if you wish to ask your question, please. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your presentations. This is Pablo Ferro from Guatemala. Um, well, my question is for Mr. Roth. The U.S. government sent, said in 2018 that the JCPOA is a decadent and deteriorating agreement. Uh, control over Iran's nuclear weapons production is necessary, and according to data, they have increased uh, the uranium enrichment in the last month. So what is your opinion about the JCPOA and its current status? Thank you very much. Thank you. Tariq, before you respond, I'm going to ask two more uh, questions uh, and then we will give a round of responses. Thank you, Pablo. Um, Enya, do you want to ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, this is Daniela Ramirez from Opanel. Um, my question is to Irma Arguello. Can you elaborate on how the IAEA and or the ABAC can verify the implementation of safeguards in the Malvins? Or what is the current status on this issue with regards to safeguards? Thank you. Thank you, Inya. And then I'll have Andrew Rogers. Do you want to ask your question? Good morning, everyone, presenters, colleagues. Um, this is Andrew Rogers from Jamaica. My question is being posed to all presenters and it reads as follows. Recognizing the limitations of safeguard agreements, particularly, particularly with respect to nuclear weapon states, especially those outside of the NPT, what would be your top three measures, diplomatic, political, or otherwise, to bridge this gap? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll, be ask, I'll ask the presenters to briefly respond. We have two more questions so far, and I'd like to have another round uh, before we conclude. So um, please go ahead. Uh, who wish to go first? Tariq, Can I respond the to the question you? on the JCPOA? Yes, please go ahead. So thank you, Pablo, for this question. Uh, in my view and in the view of many analysts, including uh, those uh, three European countries that were in the lead, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was working very well. Iran was uh, implementing the limitations in its nuclear program as verified by the IAEA. The IAEA had also worked with Iran to close the areas of questioning regarding possible military dimensions, although some work still remained to be done. Under the JCPOA, the IAEA provides the world, not only the US, but the entire international community with the details of Iran's nuclear activities. For example, as I mentioned in my slide, at the moment, Iran has 1,571.6 kilograms of low enriched uranium. There is no other methodology by which the United States would be able to get this information. So this is, was a politically motivated um, stance by the Trump administration. And even before he was elected, Mr. Trump denounced the JCPOA. As I mentioned in my presentation, after waiting for a year, Iran has been gradually stepping out of the JCPOA limitations. We all hoped that Iran would not have undertaken these activities, but unfortunately it has. But they are all reversible should the U.S. come back into uh, the JCPOA. Finally, under the JCPOA, the IAEA got verification capabilities that go beyond the safeguards agreement under the additional protocol. Iran is also the test bed for the online enrichment monitor, 
under which the IAEA can monitor enrichment online, and this can then hopefully be deployed in other countries with enrichment. Also at the two enrichment facilities, Natanz and Fordo, IAEA inspectors go there every single day. And despite COVID, the IAEA is sending inspectors to Iran using chartered flights, and IAEA inspections are continuing, and therefore the JCPOA was a net plus for the non-proliferation regime. A very quick question to the, the answer to the second question. In the nuclear weapon states and the non-NPT states, they have no obligation to accept safeguards, but they have done so for a variety of reasons. But the world took a giant step backwards in 2005 when the US exempted India and then the nuclear supplies group also provided an exemption where India could be given access to civil nuclear materials at the same level as Argentina, Brazil, Jamaica, and other non-NPT states. And here I would slightly disagree with Irma. In my view, this was a very negative uh, move by the NSG to exempt Argentina and Brazil from the additional protocol and to say that ABAC fulfills the same requirements. In practice, although it might do so, but it damages the broader regime and all NPT non-nuclear weapon states must have the additional protocol. And it is ironic that my former IAEA colleagues and friends, Director General uh, Rafael Grossi and Ambassador Rafael uh, and Ambassador Gustavo Slavonen, respectively IAEA DG and President of the NPT conference come from a country that doesn't have the additional protocol in force. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, you never uh, cease to uh, not be get a punch in there. That's good. I'd like it. So, um, Irma, do you want to um, respond to the question by um, yes. Uh, Enya? Yes, Daniela uh, from Obama. Uh, uh, really, uh, she, she requests me to elaborate on how IAEA or ABAC can verify the implementation of safeguards in Malvinas. Uh, or Falkland Island uh, for for many, so it, it is very very difficult to to say that uh, ABAC could have any any incidence on this because uh, we have there a problem of um, we have a, a, an open conflict about the uh, the sovereignty of uh, this 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 island, so um, it's, it's more likely that uh, OPANAL can do anything about that uh, and not a back uh, because uh, as has happened in the past with uh, some uh, transport of nuclear materials in in the south and atlantic i think that uh, one one path is is very difficult issue you have the additional protocols to the local treaty that could cover this this point and uh, in definitive, uh, uh, that has been signed by the United Kingdom. So it could be if the perception of any uh, uh, nuclear material or uh, 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 that could break the nuclear weapons free zone could be uh, known, uh, maybe uh, the, the, the pass or uh, would be uh, to, to try to canalize that uh, through 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 a back through through open and not through a back. Uh, in in practice, it's very difficult to address that issue. Thank you, Emma. Uh, George. Do you want to uh, also respond to uh, the question that uh, Andrew presented? I, I'm sorry, John. I, I... I've lost track of what Andrew, the question was. Uh, he was asking about, as Tariq also mentioned, uh, the limitations of safeguards agreements to uh, nuclear weapon states. Well, yes, and as Tariq mentioned, it's it's voluntary on the part of the nuclear weapon states. Uh, there have been several trial runs uh, in the U.S., uh, U.K. Um, I think the the, although who knows what the current administration thinks in the United States, uh, Heretofore, the voluntary uh, participation of these uh, weapon states has been more to encourage uh, and maybe deflect some criticism of them as being exempt from these issues. Um, the implementation of, of uh, 
uh, the 2005 amendment to the CPPNM does require those states, this is independent of safeguards in the NPT, does require those states to implement uh, uh, nuclear security aspects at, a certain, at the levels required by the CPPNM domestically. I'm not sure that that totally addresses the question, but yeah. John, can I quickly add uh, sure. two points on this? Very quick. I'll be, we have three yeah. more questionnaires. But yeah. So for the, nuclear for the nuclear weapon states, the IAEA has three criteria on the basis of which it agrees to do safeguards in the, three in the five nuclear weapon states. One is a contractual obligation. For example, China has bought Kandu reactors from uh, Canada and an enrichment plant from Russia that requires safeguards. The second is the weapon states usually have the most advanced technologies and the IAEA can learn by verifying this. And the third is what's called the hexapartite agreement. So an old agreement under which countries that have uh, six countries that had enrichment capabilities, including the US and the UK, uh, agreed to implement safeguards so that the non-weapon states are not at a disadvantage. Thanks, sorry, that was very useful. Uh, we have three more speak, uh, questions, and then I'm going to I'm going to close the questions uh, because we're running out of time. Um, so I'm asking Felix and Nicole and Augustine to uh, ask your questions, and then we'll have a brief response. We may go a little bit into the break, but uh, I would like to to have uh, a break and then start the next session on time. So, uh, Felix, uh, go ahead. Oops. I think Felix have a problem with his microphone, uh, so I'll read the question. Good morning, great presentations by all panelists. The question goes to Mr. Ralph. How could the issue of the non-proliferation of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons be promoted within the scope of Resolution 1540 to promote nuclear disarmament and the use of atomic energy and its components, thus safeguarding humanity in the planet? Um, so the next question will be Nicole. Hi, thank you for your presentations. Uh, my name is Nicole from Chile, and I have two questions addressed to all panelists. Um, first, in the context of the IAEA safeguards and technical inspections to oversee the Pacific use of nuclear energy, how does the agency deal with the industrial secrecy and other reasons that countries may argue for not showing their actual capacities? And second, could you please explain in more depth the state level approach and how is it implemented by the IEA? Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And the last question will be uh, Augustine. Augustine, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. I don't know if you can uh, listen to me. Um, yes, my we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Two basic questions. What are two of the main challenges the agency faces to get more support from the international community? And the second one will be what sorts of collaborations do the agency keeps with regional multilateral organizations around the globe to promote the non-proliferation? Thank you very much. All right, I think we'll... Um, um, why don't we go in, in, a, in a reverse order? So uh, George, do you want to start off? Sure, let me address uh, the issue of state level um, analysis. Um, the shift to state level analysis um, occurred from the agency's point of view, from the secretariat's point of view, with full knowledge of everyone. It raised some uh, concerns later at the Board of Governors uh, that uh, maybe the agency was going beyond what it should be doing. Uh, I think that's all pretty much settled out now. But the idea is that the agency should try and be aware through whatever means possible of what activities are going on in a state that might uh, affect uh, the safeguarding of, of nuclear material. Uh, starting, oh, maybe 15 years ago, the agency started uh, to develop an, an ability to use uh, satellite imagery. Uh, they get commercial satellite imagery. Uh, the agency can also receive um, national technical means information from member states that has happened in the past. Uh, that means information coming from intelligence agencies in the member states. Uh, that's maybe not trusted very well because it's not always 
uh, some states say this is unfair and we don't know, uh, you're not going to tell us exactly how you acquired this and you're not going to tell us, uh, provide us with the true picture of what's going on. Uh, it may be slanted to, uh, for your point of view. So um, right now, uh, you know, in, in order to reach a broader conclusion, um, the agency needs to look at all aspects of a state uh, to uh, ensure that uh, uh, that there's no weapons use of or potential weapons use of uh, uh, material. Uh, maybe Tariq wants to comment more on that. Thank you very much, George. Um, I, I, I want to take the first, the first question of uh, Nicole that uh, says uh, the industrial secrecy and the countries may, uh, how the countries may, may argue that for not showing their actual capacities. Uh, I, I would say that all the instruments tend to, to explicit it, that uh, they protect the, the systems, uh, protect the industrial secrecy, the, the private information, the, the national developments. Uh, but uh, in many countries, uh, uh, mostly those countries who have their own developments and are subject to, to comprehensive safeguard and, and most uh, additional protocol, are uh, reluctant to show this information uh, specifically because they they think uh, that in practice they could be the, this uh, that there could be two levels: what uh, the instruments say and what uh, happens in reality. This has been the analysis that main, many of the actors involved in this. Uh, have uh, communicated concerning the inspection of with inspectors of different regions. Um, this uh, I am uh, describing a reality. I'm not taking a, a particular position about that. But is the is the they are the these are the arguments I have listened from the the actors. Thank you. Um... Tariq, you want to uh, yeah. get the stab uh, come in? for mm -hmm. Felix's question? Yeah. So at the agency, as head of verification and security policy in the Director General's office, I was also responsible for Security Council Resolution 1540, 1373, and others. So this resolution, as you know, was adopted after 9-11 to prevent the dissemination of the chemical, biological, missile, and nuclear components and capabilities and materials to non-state actors. Since then, there has been mission creep of UN uh, Resolution, Security Council Resolution 1540. From the agency's perspective during my time, uh, uh, it was more a paper exercise that was creating more difficulties for the agency because of these requests for briefings. And as George might know, the uh, agency's Office for Nuclear Security, later Department for Nuclear Security, had its own outreach program for providing training and equipment to countries to uh, strengthen nuclear security. Uh, so this still is a controversial um, uh, Security Council resolution and also what's called instrumental use of the Security Council, where the Security Council imposes obligations that have not been fully negotiated with the membership of uh, the UN and, and, and individual uh, states. With regard to challenges for the agency, George already uh, alluded to one, one is funding. As I mentioned, the agency's safeguards budget is about 149 million euros. The annual budget for the police of the city of Vienna is more than 150 million euros a year. Some footballers in the big clubs in Europe have contracts in excess of 150 million euros a year. So this shows you the disconnect between states championing non-proliferation and what they are prepared to do to fund international non-proliferation verification organizations. With regard to intelligence and open source information, this is also an issue for the agency to independently authenticate and verify such information. Unfortunately, because of Iran and Iraq, the agency is being subjected to political pressures. There are instances of the agency being provided fake and fabricated information 
uh, which makes the task of the agency very difficult. And in the broader spectrum, it undermines safeguards. Uh, agency has an agreement with the CTBTO, as Jean would know when he was serving there to share the CTBTO's valuable data from its uh, uh, earthquake uh, monitoring uh, capabilities to monitor against tsunamis and so on. But generally, member states do not want close connections between the IAEA, the Chemical Weapons Organization, and the CTBTO because they claim there are separate legal authorities under which they have joined these treaties and accepted different verification uh, systems. And finally, with regard to confidentiality, uh, the agency has a very strict confidentiality regime. So states should be confident that there will not be leakage of technical information. With regard to Argentina and Brazil, Brazil does not provide full access to agency inspectors to its cascades. Uh, during my time, the agency could only use what's called bird's eye view, overhead cameras that only look down. The agency inspectors could not go through the cascades as in Iran or in the European uh, countries. And there are also questions about the origins of Brazil's enrichment technology, whether it is entirely 100% indigenous or whether there was some imports from the past that for one reason or another, the Brazilian Navy does not want to inform the IAEA. You, you are mute. You're mute, uh, Jan. Sorry. I uh, there's, we are actually out of time, but there's one more question that popped up, um, and I, I'm going to ask um, Gamaliel to ask the question, but please be brief and then for Irma to respond. Uh, thank you. Good morning to all, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, I'm going to ask something that uh, Mr. Rolf just uh, addressed a bit of the answer, but still, I want to ask her, Dr. Arguello, uh, what do you consider uh, has been the harshest moment during the mutual verifications between Brazil and Argentina, considering the traditional rivalry between those nations. Thank you very much. I, I think that the harshest moment hasn't been between Brazil and Argentina, and, but uh, the, the countries uh, concerning the IAEA inspection. And I, I think that they have been uh, duly explained by Tariq in the, in the last question. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end. Unless uh, does any one of the panelists have a, a final thought? All right. If not, I would like to thank all three panelists. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, as a pity that we always run out of time, um, but I think the information that conveyed, as uh, as well as if you share the slides with the participants, would be most helpful. So, uh, on behalf of the seventy-four attendees out there uh, i'd like to thank you very much for uh, your time and um, the, the very engaging uh, presentations as well as uh, your remarks uh, and responses to the questions so thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, evening afternoon or morning wherever you might be <laughs>